Hey, welcome to Diffuse Congruence. Uh, this is episode 121 of the American Muslim Experience and Ramadan Mubarak to our listeners. And of course, Ramadan Mubarak to you, Omar. How are you doing? Hey, Ramadan Mubarak, Prabhu, Assalamualaikum, and uh, to our listeners as well. Yeah, things are good. We're coming up on week two already, and it's um, it's been good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, time flies. I know we say that every Ramadan, but um, like I actually was lightweight, like trepidatious and nervous about this Ramadan. I was just, I don't know, I was just, like not like where I was like physically, mentally, spiritually. So I, but uh, Alhamdulillah, like now I'm, you know, I'm feeling like I'm in the swing of things. And so things are starting to, um, you know, become more um, routine and that's a good thing. And got a nice little cadence and schedule going of things, of things. Yeah. Although we were up at 3 a.m. last night. Uh, yeah, last night we had our, yeah, that's right. We had a little get together with some friends. That was nice. That's right. But um, anyway, we, yeah, we hope our listeners are having a great Ramadan. And we thought in the spirit of Ramadan, um, a topic that I imagine uh, for a greater or lesser extent is on all of our minds, which is to eat right, which is to try to get as much energy as you can throughout your day. And obviously, the big question, the big word hydration and just try try to stay as hydrated as possible especially uh, uh on those late nights omer when you're uh, up till 3 a.m um at a at a uh, well, at a kebab house trying to eat yeah pr- as much protein good healthy protein as yeah. we possibly could right right, right omer yeah uh I, yeah we, we won't tell the listeners about the root beers that we that we <laughs> downed but uh anyway why don't you tell us uh, yeah omer why don't you tell us who our wonderful guest is and uh we'll uh looking forward to talking with her yeah we're delighted to have dr sophia rani on the on the program uh dr sophia started her career as a clinical pharmacist managing patients drug therapy at baylor medical center in dallas uh being around very sick people on a laundry list of medications was an everyday norm for her and it never failed to her to surprise her how many medications a human or one human could be on at us at the same time so in 2010 something shifted. It started with an idea of her doing a weight loss challenge with a couple of friends. And by the time her friends asked some of their friends, word had spread and 35 women had joined this challenge. 12 weeks later, 35 lives were changed for the better. And this was the start of Sophia's journey in health and wellness. Her passion was and still is helping women get healthier, stronger, and more confident in their body. Since then, Sophia has worked with hundreds of women individually and in group settings, and she now practices as a health and wellness coach. She's also a National Association of Sports Medicine personal trainer and is on her way to becoming a certified Jay Shetty life coach. She's passionate about helping women get healthy and strong at any age and has said that the best part of my job is seeing women start believing in themselves, radiating, radiating confidence, loving themselves, and knowing that they can get a healthy, can get healthy and lead a well-balanced life. So welcome, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Omar and Perez. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's great to connect again, uh, Sophia. I know we, we 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 go back a few years, and uh, but we had sort of lost touch. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a great opportunity to reconnect. And uh, we, um, you know, uh, really, I think, uh, are going to value the perspective that you bring, uh, not only with your life experiences that you have, but um, just you know, sort of your thoughts on kind of the you know areas around health and wellness, uh, especially around issues that impact the Muslim community specifically. Um, I should note you're joining us from Southern California. So, um, you know, you call Southern California home, but that's not always been home for you because you are originally, like myself, from the great state of Texas. So um, as we often like to do and start um, with your so-called origin story and where it sort of all began, and if you could maybe shed some light about that, um, and then we'd love to kind of get into what brought you into fitness and, 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 and you know, the, like your interest in pharmacology and so on. So, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's nice to connect. Yeah, like you said, just a couple years uh, yeah. <laughs> of a gap since uh, we last talked. That's right. Um, uh, yeah, no, um, my uh, origin story, I would have to say it was – it was quite interesting. I've lived in a lot of different countries. My dad, he um, was an aeronautical engineer. And so I actually started off um, as a child going to school in San Francisco. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And he, he worked for United Airlines at the time. 
And so we were there. And then um, over the course of the years, um, we moved to Pakistan for a little bit. And then we went to Saudi Arabia. We lived there for a couple of years. Uh, so it was very interesting just, you know, as a child being around different cultures and um, and getting exposed to all of that. Uh, and then eventually, uh, as I came into back into high school, we came back here to uh, Texas. Okay. So, so there was a lot of like moving in between, um, back and forth. And then once, once I was there, you know, finished high school, had not really an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to help people. I loved, you know, the connection, helping people. And, um, I wanted, I knew I wanted to go into the healthcare profession. And so that's kind of where I was like, okay, well, I was exploring different, you know, healthcare, um, uh, professions and my, I guess, love for chemistry <laughs> and biology is kind of what made me think about pharmacy school. And so at the time I was like, okay, well, this doesn't, you know, it's not going to take me 10 years to do pharmacy. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, maybe I should do this. And then once I, um, you know, got into pharmacy school, it, it just, you know, it kind of propelled me in the direction of, I liked what, what, you know, it was helping people get better. Right. And so, so yeah. So then I, uh, at university of Texas at Austin, um, that was home. And I think I know all the libraries on that campus. <laughs> <laughs> hook them, ho hook them horns. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Great, great, uh, great campus, great school. Um, you know, it's funny, you were saying biology and chemistry being kind of your loves, um, unusual loves, but I know it make, made, made your very desi parents very happy. So, um, you know, that you were love, you were loving chemistry and biology, I'm sure. Right, right. Yeah. The typical, <laughs> you know, that's doctor. right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it was, it was either going into that or going into the arts. And I think they, they, they like the fact that I went this, you know, I think people like us need to come up with like a phrase. Uh, I'm going back to the idea that you or the what you shared about growing up in so many different, you know, places moving around a lot, because you're talking to two people who shared that exact childhood. Yeah. Um, I mean, albeit different places, perhaps, but not so really, actually. Yeah, yeah really. actually a lot of overlap. <laughs> I've pretty really? much lived in Saudi Arabia, Texas and in well, the West Coast. I mean, I, I, a lot of my yeah, obviously childhood was in also in Washington state, but yeah, there's definitely yeah. some overlap. But, but, but the one common denominator here is our, all of our dads were engineers in different capacity. And so when people ask, I always like use something like, well, I'm kind of a military brat without the military, but there should be like a Desi engineering brat, um, you know, column or that we invent because oh. we, it's, it's a lot of shared experiences. I'm sure Sophia, I'm sure you, you, you've come across people, Again, same kind of background, you know, your dad, like their dad was an engineer and hence they moved around a lot. You know, that was kind of the norm, I think, um, for a lot of people, especially immigrants, you know, of that generation from like the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, um, my God. Yeah. I like that. I, I really yeah. I, I literally would like, you know, gravitate towards uh, military, you know, kids who were in high school who are like, you know, military parents, kids. That's right. Because you're trying to find a vernacular that, you know, where where you can share your experiences in like shorthand. And so, yeah, uh, military brat without the military. You know, that's how I, I often tell people um, because then they get it. They're like, OK, so you moved around a lot, blah, blah, blah. So but yeah, we need to come up with our own, like I said, like shorthand <laughs> for our for our kind of shared experiences. Um, so after you after you graduated, yeah. did you then start practicing as a pharmacist? Yeah. So after I graduated, uh, I was the last year where we had the option of getting a bachelor's or a doctor of pharmacy. So um at that time, reluctantly, because my dad was like, go for the doctor. And I was like, oh, but it's another, you know, another year. <laughs> but uh, in retrospect, I'm glad he, you know, pushed me towards that. And uh, yeah, so then I graduated um, with a doctor of pharmacy. And then after that, I did a one year residency. So pharmacy school, if for pharmacists, you can also do residencies to specialize and to get more experience. Mm. And so I worked at the Denver VA at for a year and did my residency over there. So, um, so the you you were saying it was the last year that that was offered. Um, so is is it no longer a doctorate option or no longer a, a bachelor degree option? Like you have to go with the PharmD 
Yeah. So now it's only farm D you cannot do a bachelor's anymore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, it's so, I mean, you can, but you can actually call yourself Dr. Sophia Vani, right? Yes, I can. Yeah. See, <laughs> that's awesome because <laughs> With, 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 so like I, I'm a, I, you know, I'm, you, yeah, you probably know I have a law background. Um, and uh, you know, the JD, the D is also a doctorate, right? It's a doctorate of jurisprudence. But I can't call myself Doctor Pravez Emma. It's, it's just too bad. So, um, you know, way to go <laughs> being able to have the DR as a prefix without uh, the pains of medical school. But uh, of course, you worked hard. But I'm just saying, right? I mean, you know, yes. Uh, but, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll, um, I'll have to, I have to tell just on a side note, I have to tell a funny right. story. So my, my, my dad's also a PhD, but, um, in, but in engineering, right. And, uh, his mom, my grandmother, she has always wanted a doctor in the family. Right. So she would be like, Hey, um, and he's the should, only son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he didn't, <laughs> he didn't, he became the PhD, but not the, not the medical doctor. She wanted a medical doctor. So right. she would, uh, she would say, Hey, become a doctor. And I, and I'd tease her back and be like, yeah, maybe I'll be like dad. She's like, mm, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's one of the, just a memory not of my grandmother kind. I thought I'd share. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. She'd almost like grunt, you know, like ah, not that kind. <laughs> right. Uh, God bless her. I can totally picture that Omar. But, it, um, but yeah, uh, so you worked. Uh, uh, so the internship uh, you said it was at the Denver VA. Uh, what was that kind of where, you know, like in, as Omar read in your bio, you know, coming across people who you know literally carried carry carried along like their own personal you know pharmacy because of the amount of you know drugs and so on that they have to be on just to stay healthy or just to live a somewhat normal life. I mean, was that kind of your early experiences in that? Yes, yes, for okay. sure. It was, um, it was like a shocker because it was the VA. So obviously, uh, veterans. Um, and so medications, there were, I would say average, the list was 15. Yeah, at least 15. I mean, you know, there were there were PTSD, there were a lot of mental, um, uh, it, it uh, you know, in symptoms and issues and illnesses over there. And then there were heart and then diabetes, cholesterol, and then add, you know, renal dysfunction, whatever. So it was just a lot. And it was just crazy to see how many, you know, drug interactions, side effects, and whatnot you have to look at in order for one person. And so it was, it was a true, like, eye opener, like, wow. And just, um, yeah, so it was that way. And as a pharmacist, okay. like you're, you're kind of seeing the fact that oftentimes they'll have to give, like doctors will prescribe certain medications just to offset the symptoms because of another medication. So, you know, in this, in this, in this endeavor to try to manage symptoms, and we'll probably get into that a little bit, um, because that's kind of what doctors really are focusing on, unfortunately. That's kind of modern medicine, which is, you know, s managing symptoms as opposed to actually being able to cure ailments and disease or underlying ailments and disease. But, you know, you're, yeah, you're just sort of offsetting one medicine against another, right? For sure. And it's, you know, if, if one, you know, first line therapy doesn't work, move on to second, you know, what's second line, what's third line. So it's just like one to another to another if a side effect comes up with the first line therapy, switch this, and then you have to figure out, okay, what's going to happen with the other medications. So yes, there was definitely that. And, uh, you know, at that point when I was there, um, it didn't even cross my mind it, it, because you're just so focused on trying to get these patients to feel better that the long-term, how to take care of yourself long-term, like the lifestyle, it's, it's, it's just so hard to, to try to bring that in as well. Um, so, so, so I can see the, it's so hard to balance those things in that situation. So question about, you know, you mentioned these are, these are veterans, right? So, and, and they have, they have like 15 prescriptions on average. Is that, is that common outside the veteran community? And, and so if you, your average American, right, what's, what's, what's kind of the status that would the average American to, 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 is it common for people to have that many prescriptions? And, and what's kind of your unhealthy, um, like when does it get unhealthy? Like three, five, ten? Uh, I think that's a very individualized question. Um, but as far as, you know, I feel like, yeah, veterans probably do are on a higher list or a longer list of medications. But 
I've also worked at CVS and, you know, in, in the retail environment where I get to see patients who are not that sick, who are not in the hospital. So in that situation, you'll see more of, okay, the, you know, they're either have diabetes or they have diabetes and blood pressure. So they have a combination of those two groups of medications. Um, whereas in the hospital, it's a little bit more intense. There's a like, you know, liver failure and then trying to IVs going on at the same time as, um, you know, pills and, and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's a little bit more intense for sure in the hospital setting. And it, and it sounds like it had like a, a almost a traumatization for you to see all that that actually caused you to kind of second guess the field right well yeah i mean it it was because i as you know as a um, resident you have to um, work in different um, areas of hospitals so when i was in the icu it was just very like you would see people with you know, eyes taped shut, you know, uh, breathing off a ventilator and, and they're on seven different drips, blood pressure, trying to control that at the same time, you know, a, a very high fever because of infection that's going on. And so, you know, seeing that and then sometimes not seeing those patients make it and then, um, it was very difficult. And then moving from that situation, then going to like the cancer unit, and seeing, um, you know, chemotherapy, radiation, and that aspect. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it was so, so intense in terms of trying to get everything right, that the human factor um, goes away a little bit, because you're just so focused on getting things, you know, done, like, okay, has this been looked at, or this, you know, so it's it's pretty pretty intense but then when I would go to like to the labor and delivery that would be like oh cute you know babies and then you know I'd like to go there and stuff but yeah it was it it definitely it's it opens your eye in terms of how much our healthcare is we're such a sick nation right yeah so that's a and and I'm I I really interesting you mentioned that because I want to kind of shift the conversation into that direction which is you know, you were exposed to all of these various parts of, um, like you said, healthcare, uh, different practice areas, so on, seeing different kinds of diseases and afflictions. Um, h- how much of that would you say is 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 endemic to America just being a sick nation, like you said, like uh, like we, you know, our lifestyle, perhaps, um, or is it our approach to medicine or healthcare in our country, which is as I maybe you agree or disagree with this characterization of managing symptoms more than it is actually being able to like focus on underlying cures, um, you know, and and ailments. So if you could talk maybe a little bit about that, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you kind of nail, uh, hit the nail on the head right there is to where our healthcare system is, um, more reactive and we treat the symptom versus the cause, Uh, and it's like, you know, these medications, there is definitely a place for medication and, you know, that is, is vital. Um, but in terms of going to a root cause, there's, there's a, there's a huge gap when somebody gets ill and then they go to the doctor, for example, let's take somebody who, who, who is pre-diabetic, and they go to the doctor, they get their labs done, and the doctor tells them, okay, well, you know what, um, your glucose A1C, whatever the values are, they're, they're a bit high, so just be careful, um, you know, uh, take care of your, you know, exercise and eat well, you know, take care of your diet, and then uh, come back in three months if it's, or six months, and if it goes higher, we'll put you on medication. So there's this very sort of like, okay, if that doesn't work, then we're going to put you on medication. Well, if, if the patient doesn't know at that point how to take care of themselves, then, then they are going to come to a point where their values are going to go high and they are going to become diabetic and they will have to go on medication. So the emphasis is not placed in the area where, how does a patient take care of themselves? That's a great point. Because it is, it is you, you know, you talk about America being reactive. That's almost human nature, right? It's almost human nature to be reactive. But what you're talking about is, okay, you bridge the gap between that human nature and the ideal state, which is everybody 
being proactive with knowledge, right? That's what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. With knowledge and also I feel um, options. So mm. when when you go to the doctor and they say, okay, well, you know, you will either go on medication, but when you go home, you need to change your lifestyle. Well, this is a program that you can, or, you know, work with so-and-so in order to take care of the underlying cause, which That's is great point. Down to what Purvey said is like uh, our American uh, diet, right? It's called the SAD diet, a standardized American diet, which leads to pretty much the ideology of most chronic diseases in this country. Mm, yeah. Which actually I have that, that as a question, I mean, in terms of like genetics versus lifestyle sort of thing, but um, something you mentioned that I, I found interesting, um, you know, like the how, like the patient isn't told, okay, well, look, you know, uh, you, you have six months and maybe you come back, get retested. And in those six months, you can focus on diet and exercise, maybe try that. If you don't want to go on this, say statin, for example, to uh, lower your cholesterol, um, but the how, like, okay, what is this person, what is this patient, what is this person going to do now for the next six months to try to lower their cholesterol on their own? Um, is that just by nature of the fact that, unfortunately, you learn a lot in medical school, we were joking about it at the outset, but you don't learn actual, with a focus on nutrition and diet and certainly, you know, maybe even an, an active lifestyle. So is that, is that something that you found when you're, like I said, on the receiving end of prescriptions being sent from doctors um, and they don't have a clue about, like I said, the, these broader sort of more um, proactive measures that a patient can, can take? Yeah, no, I, I don't think there is an, enough emphasis placed on uh, personal um accountability, taking care of oneself and learning those skills. And somebody, we won't even know what to do. And, and, and people, okay, say, for example, they're really excited. They're like, you know what, I want to take care of my health. They will start without having a, a roadmap, a plan, and they might do something for a week or two, or maybe even a month. But if they don't even know what, you know, what to measure, what outcomes to measure, what to look for. And they're only looking at, which most people do is weight on a scale and they don't see anything changing, then they don't even know what, what they're, what they're doing. And they might just be like, ah, it's not working. Forget it. And yeah. So then they just be like, okay, we'll see. I'll just get on medication. Right. Because again, like you said, like the metrics that they're measuring success are not correct in that case. So devil's advocate, right? Let me play devil's advocate. What's because I've heard I've heard doctors say everybody needs to be on statins, like everybody should be honest. Right. So why why not? And I'm just playing devil's advocate, but why not be like, hey, everybody on statins and then you don't have to worry so much about it. Right. I kind of get like why 10, 15 uh, pills would be bad because they have side effects. but. Hey, you know, You're what's wrong with the example what, of a statin, for example? Yeah, yeah. Let's say statin or diabetes. Very common. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So just devil's advocate. Like, hey, you know what? Just don't worry about. It. Don't stress out. Just take a couple of these are modern medicine, uh, science at its best, right? And because I don't want to assume all our listeners are sold on the idea that hey, um, there's a there's a downside here. Yeah. No, that's that's true. And 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 then we also have to, you know, like you were saying in in med school or even in pharmacy school we we hardly touched on nutrition uh, we were actually taught uh in in a class i still remember that oh you can give a patient a specific medication and and you can give it until their liver function is 70% and then after that then if it gets to less than 7 more than 70% non functioning then you move on to the other medication so at that time it didn't, you know, we were just like trying to study and get everything in, but retrospectively looking back, that is terrible. Like you're trying, you're damaging your liver up to 70% and then moving on to another medication, which your liver is one of the most important detoxification organs in our bodies. That's right. So and, and, and the connection I think to statins, right, I think is meaningful here because like I think one of the side effects, known side effects at least, is there's it, it, it's its impact on the liver, correct? 
Exactly. It's impact on the liver. It's impact on our energy, on our mitochondria, uh, which is uh, our energy source. Uh, and, uh, and also, if you actually look at these studies that were done, I was actually reading about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the difference, the so I think it was around 80,000 out of 80,000 or some, I, I can't, don't quote me on this, but um, only about two to two to six people um, lowered, it lowered their cholesterol, LDL, about a couple of points. Mm. So is that even worth putting somebody on a statin knowing that it could like decrease, you know, hurt their liver, it can cause um, muscle cramps. It can cause other side effects as well as um, decrease um, our energy because it it um, the way it works is by um, it's an H HMG CoA reductase inhibitor which is an enzyme that it blocks. Well, if you block that, then you also block energy production. Wow. So. So, so it sounds like there's yeah. always a side effect. Am I right? I think that's the yeah. right. That's the, the that's takeaway. The, kind of the takeaway, right? There's always going to be some side effect. It's just mm-hmm. that uh, we've been kind of hearing that. Oh, don't worry about that. It's not. It's not that big a deal, basically. Yeah, and I think okay. Yeah, some people should be on it, but I don't think it should be like candy and just be like okay, you know, here you go, get on a statin, Lipitor for you, and then, and then as a society, I also feel like we we just we we're just okay with taking that for the rest of our lives then. Right. And I think, I mean, and, and this is important, I think to worth like mentioning, we've talked, you know, a little bit about endemic to our culture, our lifestyle in America, but I mean, let's not pretend or hide the fact or deny the fact, I should say that, you know, pharmacology is big money. Pharmacology is a big, you know, it, like I call it the pharmacological industrial complex because, you know, like the military, it has a, an insatiable appetite for more and more funding. And that's what, we do as Americans. Uh, it's, I think, second to only the military in terms of the amount of money that we spend on pharmacology. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it's it's institutionalized, right, where that approach to medicine or that approach to wellness, which is, hey, pop a pill, call me in the morning, um, you know, is, is, is very much, yeah, a part, you know, or is a result of that. Big money talks. Oh, for sure. Big money. Um, diabetes, right? Insulin. One yeah. vial of insulin can be up to three, three hundred, four hundred dollars, and how is somebody supposed to even afford that if they are taking two or three vials a, a month, whatever uh, the case may be? But that's that's expensive for the average uh, or low income person who who might have diabetes. That's so right. Definitely, so, yeah. So I'm curious. So as because we talk about kind of. Um, we talked about the pharmacy industry, but also the state of people today, right? Well, kind of America, but maybe drilling down a bit to, into two areas. Uh, I know we wanted to talk about the Muslim community, but also youth, right? I'm, I'm curious, and that's been a provision I've been talking kind of offline about that topic in general. Like there's on one hand in the Instagram culture, like people are really into health and wellness and maybe I won't say wellness, I'll say health <laughs> and fitness uh, and their looks. And, you know, if I, you know, if a 15 year old guy doesn't have washboard abs, then it's like, you know, he's going to get made fun of and things like that. Right. So there's, there's that pressure. So is that coming with um, health as well and wellness or are those not correlated? And then also the, going from that top from youth also, I'm curious what, where things are at with the Muslim community. And I know we wanted to talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so the first one uh, where the youth and if they're being, um, what was the question about the youth? So, so like there, there, we know there's an emphasis on youth to just be like fit and style and look good and Instagram worthy and all that, right? I'm wondering mm-hmm. if, if that is also coming with true like – Approach to wellness, approach like to healthy, wellness and health, yeah. or is, or you know, because because like I see, I do see kid, like I do see kids. On one hand, they're not eating, they're not drinking Coke at age 13, 14, like we did in the eighties, right? And so, is that is that translating into overall positive effects, or is it are are among the youth are they not still paying attention to the types of things that you 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 want them to pay attention to? Um. 
Okay. So childhood obesity, um, one out of five children uh, in our country are obese. And so that's the prevalence is about 19.3% for um, childhood obesity. So obesity is becoming a problem. Um, there might be kids who for Instagram and, you know, that might be a very small population, but I feel as far as education wise, and I'm, I'm coming from a place where, you know, I'm a mother, um, and I have a 16, 18, um, and older, uh, 22 year old, but I have, I I've been around kids. I've been around schools. I've been very involved with their schools and just talking like at that micro level, um, and as they become adolescents, they're, they really don't know what they're eating. If it yeah. tastes good, they're eating it. Right. <laughs> and, and the food these days, um, they're just so full of sugar, so full That's of right. food dyes and chemicals and things that they don't even know they're harming their body. So I just think that if they even knew a little bit to how, what is what they're putting in their mouth, there might actually be some, um, they might stop, uh, at least to some extent yeah. or get a little bit better. But I, 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 I feel like our youth, um, the pre-diabetes and it's not even called adult onset diabetes anymore because type two diabetes is occurring in teens. Right. And, and so I, I think there is a huge problem yeah. as they're growing up. Yeah. And, and, I think Omar's a little forgiving because I mean, like I, you know, yeah, fine. In the eighties, you know, maybe there was a propensity of like having, you know, young people have Coke or whatever, but now it's, you know, and Coke in the eighties, I should, I should clarify Coca-Cola. <laughs> sorry. I, you know, in my head, when I, when I, when I heard Coke in the eighties, I, I know, I know how that sounded. You, you've been um, watching too many, uh, too many uh, Scorsese <laughs> movies. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, I, I think, if you look at the, I think Sophia is right on point because I think if you look at the average teenage diet, it's, it's riddled with sugar, um, you know, saturated fats, all kinds of dyes and chemicals. I mean, you look at those, like uh, almost every variety of chips now has those uh, highly, like very spicy brands. It's not mm. just, remember it started off as like Takis or whatever, but now from Doritos to Funyuns to, and Flame I know and this hot. because <laughs> flaming hot, right? And I know this, I mean, sadly, because my own kids went through that phase. And so, you know, that's prevalent. I mean, you see that everywhere. Uh, yeah, they're not maybe consuming Coca-Cola, but it's like, you know, um, energy drinks and so on that are just, again, filled with sugar. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's no surprise then that we are are seeing the increase in child, in teenage and childhood obesity that Sophia was mentioning. You know, um, you know, real quick, I have to share. I've never had an energy drink. I don't think I've ever had like an energy drink, but somebody delivered like we got a DoorDash the other day. Uh, of uh, rock rock star, I think it is. Yeah, rock star is one and, monster. And, and I'm, I, you know, I, I have the, I have that. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll call it the desi in me, or just whatever it is. You know, th that doesn't want to throw anything away. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, I'm like looking at this. I'm like, man, man, I, I don't want to throw this away. But, but if I looked at the ingredients in one can, it was literally like 300 plus calories. It said something like. 200 of 200 milligrams of caffeine i mean it was basically like drinking multiple coke coca-colas and multiple co cups of coffee plus a whole bunch of other stuff and i and i know kids do drink and adults actually at work drink this stuff right oh yeah yep. oh yeah. yeah yeah they even have a diet version which is hilarious or a light version but anyway i did yeah. throw it in the garbage you'll be proud good good yeah. good yeah 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 gotta exercise that desi in you man um yeah. but um uh anyway yeah so uh but sophia like i i guess you know, shifting maybe a little bit because I, I think what we are seeing in the broader population, certainly Muslims are not immunized, I should say, and we'll get into maybe some, we'll talk about COVID also a little bit, but we're not necessarily, you know, um, inoculated or immunized from those type of tendencies as well. And so hence we see the kind of alarming rates of heart disease, diabetes in our own community. Um, how much of that is just a product of, and this goes back to that the question I wanted to, uh, that I teased earlier about genetics versus lifestyle, right? Because you're talking about a community, let's say that's, you know, by and large, African American, um, uh, Arab, and subcontinent, right? And, and my understanding, at least from these three populations, and of course, there are others, but these three populations do have a higher than normal rates of those same diseases, even back home. So 
is 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 that struggle like again how much of it is genetics and how much of it is i guess how, like how, how much is the how much do we blame the biryani and biryani the korma and the chicken right? Yeah. yeah right or no how much do we blame the biryani or how much do i blame the fact that fact that i just happen to be born so that's what i'm saying yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, right exactly exactly it's, right you know you can easily take it off of you and say oh it's in my genetics you know my yeah. my dad has heart disease he had a stroke my mom had a heart attack diabetes cholesterol b- b- blood pressure i have everything so um so okay you know just forget about take care of myself i'm just going to develop it and you know not care about doing anything so we can take that off of us and just blame it on genetics but yeah there might be some genetic predisposition but the expression of those genes happens by what you do from the external environment. Wow. So how you are your lifestyle, really, like what are you putting in your body and how are you moving your body? Um, it even depends on community. Um, do you have a good social network, stress levels? And so, so the, we can't blame it all on genetics. There's so much we can control. And that's what we have to learn. Mm. Yeah. And this actually leads me to like, I mean, for the average, like take a listener that's out there listening right now. And yes, they're on a regiment of pharmaceuticals, whether that includes statins, blood lowering, blood, blood, blood pressure, et cetera. Obviously this is individualized, but let's just speak on an aggregate level. Like can people turn the clock as it were? Can a, can a, can a person who is, Again, because of either genetic factors or lifestyle factors, or let's focus on the lifestyle factors. They have, you know, they are they they have to take statins. Can they turn the clock? Can they, you know, do something different now? When it, you know, or is it too late? And are you now predisposed to that for the rest of your life? Great question. And I would have to say it's never too late. It's never too late. Um, I'll give you an example. My dad, he had a stroke a couple of years back. And um, at that time, he's he's already diabetic. He's been diabetic for years, has high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, all the lists uh, of medications. He's on those. And when they checked his A1C, which is the, um, you know, per, the lab value that you look at, how high or your diabetes, how bad your sugar levels are controlled in your body. Um, his was super bad. It was, it was around, I don't even I think it was 12 or 13. And for diabetics, it should be around six, mm. less than seven. And he came and he stayed for me for seven weeks. I put him on a very regimented plan and you know, he, he couldn't move as much because he was, he had a stroke. Um, and so, but it was all food based his A1C within eight weeks when it was rechecked, it came down from that number down to like seven. And this is a, this is, this yeah. is somebody, you know, in his seventies. Wow. So, so we can change we can change and the change won't take long as long as we're committed, as long as we know what to do, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have the support, then we can make tremendous changes. And we should never think that, Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at this age, I can't do anything. That's a great point. Um, and I, and I, I want to kind of continue that conversation, I guess this is a footnote, you know, cause we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I mean, it's no secret that, you know, during this pandemic, there's been so much focus, so much focus on COVID, obviously uh, we're living through a pandemic of it, but, you know, I think one of the things that gets unfortunately missed in a lot of the news sensational s- sensationalism is the fact that again, you know, outcomes for people who have obesity or outcomes for people who are, who have, um, uh, who have, yeah, like are either obese or have diabetes or other comorbidities uh, is much, 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 much worse than it has been for people who are overall healthy, have healthy immune system. Um, Maybe if anything, if you could, Sophia, like talk about maybe immune system in particular and what, let's say the average person can do um, on a daily basis to boost immune levels. I think that's Right. I mean, again, people get the obesity part of it. I mean, and 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 we'll get to that as well. But I, I mean, here maybe as a good point as any to talk about a little bit about 
what your suggestions are for people who, um, you know, who suffer or are, you know, who don't have an immune system that's in the best order. Um, you know, cause one of the things that shocked me, and this was something that I found out, I think it was a couple of years ago when I had my annual kind of blood work done was my vitamin D levels were low. And I, and my doctor said that that's actually pretty common as most Americans are, have low vitamin D levels. And, and, you know, and we know that vitamin D obviously has bearing on our immune system. So um, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. So as far as immune system goes, we have to really sort of look at our body as a whole. Okay. And the first thing that now in in the past, I would say um, what's become a very buzzword is the microbiome and gut health. I think our immune system is very closely linked to our gut health, which then is linked to what we put into our bodies. And so immune system and taking care of your immune system is very connected with how we are eating and we're eating for ourselves, but there are these, um, this whole ecosystem in our gut that they are helping us break down different vitamins, different medications, foods into the active form in order for them to then do what they need to do in our body. Wow. And at the same time, if we have this dysbiosis or imbalance for, with the good and bad bacteria in our gut, then if the bad bacteria take over, then those then will cause, um, we have a gut lining, right? Which is a barrier between our gut and our blood uh, in our body. So that lining then gets um, corroded or it kind of like leaky. Maybe you've heard of the leaky gut uh and, and, and those are the bad bacteria is what causes this leakiness. And those, um, whatever toxins are leaked into our bloodstream. And then right next to our gut lining is our immune cells. So 70% of our immune system cells are in our gut right there. Wow. Okay. So once they see these like, you know, toxins or bad things coming into our body, then our immune system is like, whoa, what's going on? Okay, so we need to defend our body and take care of it. So then this whole like reaction starts and then we get inflammation and different things can happen. Autoimmune dis or dis disorders can then be triggered and a lot of different things can happen. So there, it's just such a flow going from, you know, how to protect this immune, you know, barrier. It all stems down to how we are eating for ourselves and how we're eating for our gut. Wow. I never kind of heard it bro broken down that way, to be honest with you, Sophia. So thank you um, for sharing that. Um, uh, yeah, the like the sort of the underlying connections between, again, the foods we eat and again, our immune system, right? I always thought that it was other supplements or I mean, of course, you hear about vitamin C and so on. But the way you broke it down into I think it's it's far more far more detailed than just, you know, having foods that are saturated in, you know, vitamin C or vitamin D alone. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the thing yeah. is like, even if we do have those supplements, uh -huh. if we don't have the right bacteria to break that supplement down into the active form, you're just taking that supplement for, for no reason. That's if things aren't point. right. So yeah, that's yeah. getting to the really root cause. <laughs> um, if you could, you know, like one of the things, and, and I want to get to Ramadan specifically, and, and you know, we want we want to definitely spend some time on that. But as we kind of wrap this general more over, um, I guess this broader conversation around health, what is, and we talked a little bit about this, but like when we talk about metrics, right? Like, again, people talk about getting on a sta scale, how much they weigh and what, what the number is on that scale. Um, but what are good metrics for good health? Like, sorry, what are, what are appropriate metrics and the best metrics by which we can gauge whether or not we are in quote unquote good health? And, and kind of related to that is, do those change over time? Because I've heard like, mm. as you're older, when like really old people, it's actually bad for them to be too skinny and, and so on, right? So I, I don't know if, if that factors into if those if those evolve over time, like your BMI should go up and down or, and, but I'll, I'll let you speak to it. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned BMI, Omar, because I think like even that, like, I think um, that used to be because, you know, 
obviously people kind of started moving away from the scale being the end all be all of good health. But then, and I think there was this heightened focus on BMI, but I'm told, I mean, even BMI obviously doesn't paint the full picture because, you know, it's, it's all based on height, weight, proportionality, which a person can be, you know, I don't know, super short, but have, you know, high BMI, but that could be mostly muscle anyway. So yeah. Okay. I'll leave it to the expert. Sophia. Yeah. Your comment on that. Yeah. Sure. So, so I'm just going to pick it up from where you stop pervades is where, um, BMI, let's just take BMI for a second and we'll then put in body fat percentage, um, to taking a look at that as, um, as a measurement. So if you, for example, imagine a person who is 150 pounds and, uh, you have somebody who is five, five, 150 pounds and another person five, 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 150 pounds. One of them is an athlete and their muscle mass is, you know, super high and they're very fit and they have say 16% body fat. Whereas you have this other person who is metabolically very sick, um, body fat percentage is, uh, body fat percentage is about 50% and muscle mass is low. They can mm -hmm. both have the same BMI and, and, you know, maybe, maybe one of them can be considered, you know, okay. And the other one can be considered obese, but that's, to me, is not a good measurement because you're not looking at the composition of what your body is. Are you fat? Are you muscle? And so to me, looking at body fat percentage is very, very, a very good indicator. So that's something that somebody can do and get that number and then work from there. And so for uh, different ages and different, you know, men, women, it's different. So for example, for women, if you're more than 32%, you're considered obese. And um, so if, if that, if, and what does that really mean? It basically means that, you know, there's more fat than our body needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when fat becomes to, to a point that it's that high, it's not just a fat cell, it becomes, um, it, it starts spewing out toxins. So the fat that is in our bodies is also, you know, contributing to the inflammation that's occurring in the body. So then we just have to have that number and, you know, work from there. And then we get our muscle mass as well. And so um, we just kind of like change or shift our body fat percentage and bring it mm. lower. So I think yeah, I hadn't heard that either. So it sounds like yeah. it's not just the impact on like carrying around the weight, right? But it's also the toxins and probably some other stuff too, right? That's yeah. the, the negative of, of being high, higher than, um, high, higher fat, right? Right. And then it turns into there's belly fat versus um, subcutaneous fat. And belly fat around our abdom abdominal area, that is much more um, increased risk of cardiovascular disease versus subcutaneous fat. So if somebody notices that their, you know, their abdominal fat is increasing, then that's an, uh, just a visual indicator. Like, okay, I need to do something about this. Mm, mm. Is that like when people talk about like fatty cell, uh, I forgot what it was called, but something like that, right? Where is that sub -tanious? So, so subcutaneous fat is kind of like more around the hips or, you know, oh, okay. legs or, you know, just underneath the skin. Got it. The belly um, is more uh, the abdominal fat region got it got it okay yeah. and, and they have different sort of health consequences like yes. like you said how uh, like outcomes vary based on right. where you carry that 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 yeah fat. so that's the more toxic area okay the fat so again you mentioned for women generally speaking again age etc but less like what's the ideal number then i mean we, you said 30 percent or higher that's obese but what what would be a good body percentage fat for the average man or woman in so your estimation so the woman, there's a range. It's like from okay. 26 to 32% is considered a good, you know, being in that area. And then once you move down to, I think it's like 20 to 24, it's considered fit or active. And then lower, a little bit lower than that is considered like an athlete. And so there's same measurements for like men, but uh, for men, it's a little bit less because women do carry more um, fat than men. And so, um, so yeah, so I think that's a good measurement. Uh, looking at uh, there's an inflammatory uh, lab value that you can check. Um, you can request it from your doctor when you go there. It's called CRP, 
which is a C-reactive protein. It's a nonspecific marker for inflammation in the body. But if it is high, then you know there is some sort of inflammation going on in the body. And that is a super good indicator that, okay, uh, inflammation, not good, need to figure out what's going on. So that's good. And then like you had mentioned, vitamin D, super important um, vitamin. Some even call it a pro-hormone. It's, it has so many different um, uh, reactions that it helps in our body that, uh, and also um, it seems to help with uh, recovery and, you know, uh, prevention for COVID. So that's something that you want to take a look at your lab, uh, lab value. Where are you? Usually it's from 20, I think is nanogram per milliliter, something like that. And the range is from 20 to 60 or, or 20 to 70. Um, it's different for different labs like Quest or LabCorp. Um, but, um, but the, the lower end, which is 20, it doesn't mean that if you're at 20, you're good. It's not doesn't mean that's not the optimal level. Okay. So optimal level might be even a little bit higher than 20. So so if you're at the lower end of the range, even if you're within normal range, you want to try to go a little bit higher within that range. Okay, okay. Um, and And what is it about our diet, perhaps? Or is it sunlight related? I don't know, like, we don't spend enough time outdoors uh, mm-hmm. that that, 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 that we are seeing larger and larger number of people who have some sort of level of deficiency when it comes to vitamin D. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, yeah. I mean, both when COVID, <laughs> happened, when COVID happened, most people were in their houses Good and point. nobody was getting out. And, and so the best time to get sun exposure in order for your body to kind of absorb vitamin D into the body is from 10 AM to 2 PM. And you go out there with a shirt, without a shirt, and, you know, expose as much skin as possible, but how many of us do that really? Yeah. Good um, point. Ten to two. I didn't even know those numbers. Okay. Wow. Okay. Fascinating. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, I guess besides being able to go shirtless in your backyard, I mean, you, you know, th- but the point being that you focus on trying to get outdoors um, and, and so, yeah, what is it about the diet perhaps that, that we're missing? Um, so diet, the foods that we're eating, right? They're ultra processed foods. They're not even called processed. They're called ultra processed. now. <laughs> they're so processed and, um, we're not eating real food. We're how, how much vegetables and variety of vegetables are we eating fruits? And we gravitate more towards the, you know, frappa cappuccino and the That's bagel right. in the morning or, you know, a muffin and kids, um, having these chips, like you're talking about Takis or whatever, Um, so there's, there's, our food is like nutritionally very like sparse. There's no nutrition value. And so that's the reason why we're deficient in these, um, vitamins. What about, I know there's some foods that are, they could be fads. I'm guessing that some, you know, when you hear about these, these superfoods or what have you, um, maybe some of them actually are good. And some of them are maybe fads. You hear about apple cider vinegar, uh, you hear about chia seeds, uh, and there's a, there's a there's a big list. I'm I'm love to hear your your thoughts on on which ones are legit and which ones maybe are more mm-hmm. you know a good way to get money out of your wallet, right? Yeah. So I think the first thing if somebody's starting on their health journey is that they should number one um, maybe get all those lab works you know different lab work done, kind of have a baseline of where they are. And, um, and then once they do that, in terms of when it comes to food, where should they start? They should think of how, um, how's their gut? How, how, how's the variety of food been that they're eating? Um, and once they establish that, okay, maybe it's not that good. And it's not just that, um, it, you know, when I do my consults with my, um, clients, I will ask them, okay, what medications have you been on? What are you on? And um, in the past two years, have you been on an antibiotic for any reason? And the reason is because antibiotics, they are kill bacteria and they get kill bacteria uh, in our gut and they kill the good ones and the bad ones, right? They're there to kill the bad ones, but they kill the good ones. So then this ratio, once again, that dysbiosis we were, we touched upon is there. So if we don't have the good bacteria, then we don't have um, um, their functionality in our body. So how do we increase our good bacteria? So probably heard about prebiotics. So there's something called pre and then something called probiotics. So you would just want to just 
first thing is just to to give your body what it's been deficient in. So start with your prebiotics and prebiotics are things like um, uh, fiber. So think about vegetables, your fibrous vegetables. Think about um, uh, lentils. They have a lot of fiber. So you want to feed your gut. Um, it's kind of like the fertilizer. And then you put in the probiotics, which then grow the the good bacteria mm. and the probiotics are your live bacteria. So whenever you buy something that's a probiotic, it has a live active bacteria that you are literally taking in and trying to get it all the way down into your, um, uh, gut. And so you want to also take a good, um, probiotic as well. And then there are certain foods that have probiotics in them. I'm sure you've heard of sauerkraut. And then um, just any sort of like fermented foods, pickles, things like that. Oh. Um, so they have um, live bacteria, kefir. kefir um, yeah. Recently of- discovered a kimchi. Kimchi, <laughs> yes. It's actually pretty good. Sound, sound, yeah. Sounds not so good. It's what fermented cabbage, I think, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So these are the kind of things that I don't even think sometimes, like I would never have thought of this. 10, 15 years ago. Right. I was, I was giving my kids, um, you know, um, I don't know, like chips, like Doritos. Mm -hmm. I didn't know back then, but now it's like, my kids are like, Oh mom, this has red dye. (laughs) I'm like, I taught you that. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, good training. Good training. Um, So um, I guess in, in, in the time that we have remaining, I, I, I would really like to focus on Ramadan. Obviously, our listeners, um, you know, uh, I would imagine the majority of them are Muslim and they are fasting and they're doing their best. So I guess starting off with what are sort of some common mistakes people make during the month of Ramadan? I mean, and maybe focusing specifically on diet, right? Um, and, and I mean, you, you can do your, you know, like the, it's indulgent, but you can certainly, you know, um, talk trash about like pakoras and samosas like we get that i think but you know you can certainly do your like 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 <laughs> requisite bashing of that of, of uh, fried foods but beyond that what are sort of some common mistakes people make during the month of ramadan especially when it comes to diet i feel like when ramadan comes around everybody just gets so worried like oh my god what's gonna happen how are we gonna do everything so mm-hmm. i just feel like Jen, just take a deep breath and just relax for a second and just kind of like zoom out zoom out, get a broader picture of, okay, what does Ramadan mean to you really? And, um, think about ways that you can, in other ways you can nourish your body. Okay. Food we'll talk about for sure. Um, but let's first talk about what are some other ways you can nourish your body? Can you take a nap in the day? Can you, um, you know, um, definitely what is something that you want to get out of Ramadan when it comes to your food? Do you want to feel more connected? If you're going to eat a lot, you're not, you're going to just feel this heaviness um, after you eat. So how do you want to feel when you're praying? Um, You know, and do you want to have this energy? And so just kind of writing down like a list of 10 things that you want to do. And then from there, you can be like, okay, so what do I need to do? Number one, like hydration. Um, We need to take care of our care of our hydration. And that is certainly very difficult because, you know, the time we're eating and then maybe sleeping if somebody's breaking their fast at 7 30 let's say and then they're going to go to sleep by 10 30 that doesn't give a lot of time um but then think of maybe hydrating foods in, in in addition to having your water or you know whatever um drink you're drinking try to stick to water or herbal teas um coffee i will allow because i need that no <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> but so, it, it, um yeah but it in Think of that and think of hydrating foods. Can you add some soups? Can you, um, you know, put in watermelon and your, you know, cantaloupe, honeydew? These are the kind of things that you can eat and just keep it light and and simple. Stay away from, you know, things that are going to dehydrate you, like your fried foods and your salt, uh, salty foods. So, you know, if you want to have a pakora, you know, that's cool. That's good. But um, just keep in mind that how are you going to feel later? Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, my takeaway from what you said is, especially from what you said in the, um, early, was um, think about what you want to get out of Ramadan, and and I think what you're saying is, don't make Ramadan about the food, and you'll naturally probably eat eat a little better because it's not about that, right? Once you start making it about the food, 
uh, then then you know it becomes obsessive almost, right? Eat yeah. to live or live to eat. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. and, and uh, you double click on on caffeine. Double right? click. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm taking a. That's uh, no, but but seriously, like, your parliament. Yeah, I know. You got got two. Right? Um, so no, but really, because that's been especially this year. I think I've had more caffeine in, in Ramadan than I have in past years. Uh, and some sometimes you know sometimes I give it up or, or you know when the days are shorter have like a tea or coffee and um, you know at Sahur and then go straight to work or whatever it is. But I feel like this year it's been especially bad. So maybe you can comment on that. Like how much water can we really try to get in realistically between, you know, eight and eight and five or, and, 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 and where does, where does caffeine come in if it's a diuretic, right? Yeah. Um, so in terms of coffee, um, if you can get off of it, that's amazing. That's great. Um, but we also have to be a little bit realistic. Um, people have to work. People, um, are used to having coffee, Maybe if you are having four cups a day, you can decrease the amount and that could be great. If you're going from four to two, that's 50% less, but you're still getting a little bit. Um, in terms of, okay, as a diuretic, yes, it is a diuretic, but then um, definitely get in um, at least, I mean, there's no magic number. Just if you feel thirsty, you know, you're not getting enough water. Okay. And and I think no matter how much we drink, we are going to feel thirsty during the day because we're just not drinking for like 15 hours. Um, but uh, get enough to also possibly have clear colored urine. So, uh, you know, it's it's and these are just very basic measurements, right? It's not like, oh, let me take out my ounce cup. So you just don't make it difficult for yourself. Like go for the low hanging fruit, go for the things you can do. And not focus on the things that are sort of like, oh, I, I won't be able to do this. What can you do? Do those things. Like get out a, you know, 30 ounce jug of water or like super tall glass and be like, okay, my goal is to have this by the evening. Yeah. And then it's so her have 20 ounces. And I think sh the more sugar you have, the more water your body actually needs to flush it out. Is that right? Yeah. It'll make you thirsty too. Right? Yeah. Mm. You know, um, and I really like the way you approached it, Sophia, like in terms of like, okay, like, look, like, you know, take a step, like take a deep breath, take a step back. What do you want this month to be about? And I, I think, um, I mean, I think that that's a great way to begin to look at the month as a whole, whether it's spiritually, physically, and, and all, and, and obviously all of that's interrelated because like you said, you know, if you're not, if you're feeling sluggish and lethargic because of the food you're eating, for example, at iftar time, folks, you're not going to be able to make prayer. You're not going to be able to sit and read Quran because you're going to be either falling asleep or you're going to be, you know, you're going to have like gastro GI problems. Let's just call it that. Um, and, and so I, I completely agree with you. Um, and, and to your point about hydration, um, it's interesting. You mentioned like a lot of variety of melons, like cantaloupe, um, watermelon, et cetera. Um, a lot of people who study this, you know, they say like that, that was one of the prophetic foods as it were. Um, the prophet ate obviously dates, but he also ate melons because melons were available. Um, and it was, so it's considered quote unquote, a prophetic food as well. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I guess the big question also around Ramadan for, at least for those of us who let's say, enjoyed living or enjoy living a somewhat healthy lifestyle or sorry, active lifestyle, sorry. Uh, and healthy of course, but, um, diet or sorry, exercise. Is it, is it encouraged? Is it discouraged and optimum times for exercise? Yeah. And I've, and, and I've actually like, for example, I a friend of mine was saying yes, yesterday he did CrossFit prior, you know, <laughs> on a, uh, during the day. I mean, like to what degree, to what degree can you actually, push yourself without it actually becoming dangerous. Right. I mean, should we just and stick harmful. to the tent? No, yeah, that's right. what I mean. Yeah. I mean, should we stick to the, the light walks or should we tr try to push ourselves and, um, mm -hmm. you know, and actually, uh, yeah. you know, push ourselves to the limit. Yeah. Um, well, number one, I feel like we we're talking about Ramadan is a time of reflection and it's a time where you really want to just, when it comes to, if you are active, if you do exercise throughout the year, you know, this is the month. Think about, first of all, we know what intermittent fasting in the uh, fat, mi fast mimicking diet, all those terms are out there. So, and what that literature has shown is that 
when the body goes in fasting mode, um, you're taking away the body's energy from digestion, and it is actually now able to use the energy to kind of clean out all the bad stuff in the body. So it's kind of like I was telling one of my clients, it's like a Pac-Man. I, I, you guys remember that, right? You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I it myself, but <laughs> right. It, <laughs> so right. it's like you're taking these bad yeah. cells in your body and your immune system's literally cleaning it up. So if we just think of like, this is a month of literally cleansing and cleaning, our bodies are doing that. And how do you, how, to what extent do you want to do that, you know, in other ways as well. And so, so don't, you know, it's okay if you don't exercise as intensely as you did throughout the 11 other months of the year, that's okay. You still have those, what, 335 days that you can do it. This might go a little bit slower. Um, you know, athletes, of course, they have a different regimen, but for the normal individual, um, if you do want to exercise, base it on your age, your, how much you've been exercising. If you haven't exercised, you don't want to start exercising. You're like, I'm going to start in Ramadan. So, you know, so you just kind of want to like, um, but the timing, uh, you either can do a brisk walk before iftar, nothing intense, just something nice. Or if you choose to exercise a more wiser time would be after you break your fast. Okay. So eat something light at iftar, work out, and then have a meal after that. And then, you know, do the all we pray and you're done. And uh, if you're an early bird who wakes up at 3 a.m., you can do it at that time as well. Good but point. the times when you're able to have water, the times when you're able to eat, you want to do it at that time because what if you end up cramping yourself? What if you... There was a, 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 a gentleman who collapsed yesterday at Juma Namaz because he was dehydrated. So uh, you really want to just be careful in this month. Don't mm. overdo it. But at the same time, yeah, you know, if you wanted to have a workout, there's nothing wrong in that. Just keep it simple and, um, and yeah, and continue, but in the evening time. Okay. Uh, that's really helpful. So you wouldn't recommend, for example, like right, like let's say half an hour, 45 minutes before iftar, to do like any kind of uh, uh, strenuous exercise, to do or cardio, <laughs> or CrossFit. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not there yet, but 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 any kind of strenuous exercise, like 45 minutes before, because the logic being, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get done, and then I'm gonna hydrate myself, and I'm gonna feed myself. Yeah, what, what are your I'm thoughts not, about I'm that? I'm not an advocate of that. I mean, okay. some people do do that, but once again, it's. Um, what what are your goals what are you trying to accomplish um you know i don't right. think there is a necessity to be that you know intense right before move on i mean right before iftar okay okay um any other thoughts about like uh i guess uh uh you know whether it's i know another thing that a lot of people focus on is like meal prep and being able to do that during ramadan and i don't mean if you're actually on some sort of a regimented plan i just mean in general like the the whole focus of the day becomes mm -hmm. what's for iftar, what's for dinner, right? Yeah. And and so, I mean, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that as well, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of time and focus and energy, I would say, is, is expended on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, the two most important things for Ramadan is stay hydrated and maintain muscle mass. And so having your protein, having enough protein, because um, if you don't have that, your, your muscle is going to you know, break down and you, you're going to lose muscle. So, so that, that, actually that, that brings a really important question. So what is again, that ideal kind of metrics for metric for protein? Cause I've heard like anywhere from, you know, one ounce per pound, like how much you weigh. Uh, and maybe that's for athletes or, you know, people who already are quote unquote relatively fit or in health, good shape. Um, is that true? Like what, what are some good numbers again for protein? And if you could, and indulge me a little bit. I mean, I used to be a vegan. I'm not anymore. So I'm just making that clear. I'm not advocating for a vegan lifestyle anymore. Uh, although I think it's a healthy way to live, but you know, put that out there. Um, but, uh, you know, now as someone who consumes all level, you know, animal fats in healthy doses and so on, or animal proteins in healthy doses, what again, you know, are some good protein sources, you know, given other health effects or, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so number one, I feel like in terms of um, the number, what what is a good number for um, the grams of protein per day? That's definitely dependent on um, 
for example, my son who's 22 and he's, you know, he lifts at night. So he will, he needs a lot more protein. Whereas I am okay with just having, you know, uh, about, you know, like a four, four, four to five ounce piece of chicken. Um, but I at least try to get it twice two 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 doses of protein in the evening and then in the morning. I always make sure that I am, I'm having a protein within my meal. Okay. So, uh, and then for men, it would be about six to six to seven ounces cooked. That would be a good amount, um, a little bit bigger filet of chicken or uh, fish. Um, but yeah, definitely when it comes to the quality of protein, it definitely okay. matters because, mm-hmm. um, you know, our bodies, we, there's some, you know, as far as like the macros, we have proteins, carbs, and fats. Um, there's something called essential fats. There's something called essential proteins, amino acids, and there's no such thing as essential carbs. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as far as carbs go, we really actually don't really need carbs, but, um, but, but fiber, essential- right? You do need fiber, right? Fiber. Yes, for sure. So, um, so when it comes to your essential amino acids, those are the ones that our bodies cannot make, and it has to come from an outside source. And that's when being a vegan or the animal, you know, source of protein makes a difference because mm. our animal proteins are, have all of those uh, essential amino acids and a very good whole source of all the amino acids. And whereas when you're a vegan, you got to be a little bit more careful if you're getting all the amino acids your body needs. So that's where that um, comes in. Um, but good sources of protein, and, and this is a great uh, a topic you brought up because it's not just I ate chicken or I ate, you know, uh, beef. What was the quality of it? You know, um, was it grass fed or was it grain fed? Because then that we're eating what the animal ate. That's right. So if their, if their bodies are inflamed because they were on antibiotics and, you know, grains, then that's going to come into us. And it's exactly. Us. So grass fed, you know, beef and um, organic chicken. So these are good sources, wild caught fish, not farm raised. These are all good sources of protein. Um, when it comes to your, um, you know, veg- vegetarians, they can do all the different sort of beans like chickpeas. And, um, you know, there's there's black beans, there's navy beans, all the when different you- beans. When you say when you talk about grass fed, we live in the Bay Area, right? So you go to you go to a Whole Foods or whatever, and you see like the 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 the, the eight dollar grass fed uh, half gallon of milk or whatever. Is that uh, is that I mean, is there an actual benefit to to like grass fed milk? And 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 then that also makes me think about dairy. Like, should we be cutting dairy? Is it? I mean, we, I grew up in the eighties. You know, you made you made the Pac Man reference. I remember seeing the commercials. Uh, after school special, you know, after, after school of, of the milk, but does a body good. Right. Good. Uh, and so I, I grew up drinking like four glasses of milk a day. Is, is that yeah. something we need to, to, to really limit as we grow up? I think it's comes down to the quality of the milk. Um, and there are certain additives that some might have RSBT, different things. Um, and it's the actual quality of the milk that is on the market now, because of that, the milk is more inflammatory, um, uh, you know, as we get older, we are more lactose intolerant. And so, uh, oh, that varies with age. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. Oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay. So, yeah. So there's really no need for, for, for milk, uh, especially if you feel like when you have it, it's not doing, you know, it's causing like some sort of gastric indigestion. So then you know that it might be uh, not good. It is inflammatory. So, uh, but I think why the grass-fed milk is much more expensive is because it is so clean that it will probably not be as inflammatory. It's, it's a better quality milk. Okay. And then what do you say about other, like now there's obviously, uh, you know, with uh, lactose alternative uh options out there so whether it's yeah, soy non-dairy, milk or non-dairy non-dairy thank you yeah um so is that is that uh, any that you recommend over others yeah so the nut milks um yeah is as long as they're unsweetened and um you know almond almond milk macadamia milk 
nut milk. Um, oat milk is a little bit higher in carbs. So I usually stay away from that. Um, because it'll increase your sugar levels, which then causes the insulin reaction and all that okay. kind of stuff. I knew it was too good to be true. I, I love oat milk. I mean, oh. I, I'm sorry. As an alternative, I have found that the yeah. sweet spot for me is not almond milk, is not, you know, yeah. cashew yeah. milk, it's but a, it's oat milk. I've recently started switching out coffee cream, like dairy cream with oat milk. And it's great. It actually makes the it no, seamless. But, but, but then to Sophia's point, right? You you gotta work you gotta watch out for the sugar and the carbs yeah. though. But remember yeah. it's only like two tablespoons, right? Exactly. Actually, yeah, and it's yeah. it's a little bit, so it's it should be okay. You yeah. know. Okay. As long okay. as you're not having it with like a big glob jamun or something. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the what about the kofi and the and the faluda? Yeah. And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, the ruafza with the milk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Pink milk. Um, so Sophia, like, uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, but I guess before we let you go, and and as as we kind of wrap the show, um, I'd love for you to kind of talk about. And you teased it um, when you mentioned about working with your clients and consulting them. Um, I, I'd love to hear about what offerings you do have for people who may be interested in, you know, uh, reaching out to you and availing you of your services. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that and feel free to, you know, go as full elevator pitch as you want. So, you know, this is your, this is your time and your forum to do that. But, um, and, and your, and your audience is like all over the place, right? So maybe you can touch on locate location or if you do it virtually and that sort of thing. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah. So I, I basically, what I do now, since I'm don't want to go back into the hospital pharmacy setting is, you know, just the health and wellness where I, I help, uh, and I mainly work with women. I do also work with men, but, uh, mainly women. And, um, uh, I help them get into a better state of health and this can be, they can be in any stage of their, their health journey. I've had, um, women in high school and 20 year olds. And I, uh, my biggest group is 30 to 40s and 50 year olds, um, women. Uh, and so wherever they are in their health journey, they don't know what to do. They're stuck. They want to lose weight. Usually uh, it's, it's, I want to lose weight. I want to get stronger. And then once we start talking, then I start implementing and, you know, kind of like telling them a little bit, I, I want to educate them about all these different areas. So I talk about gut health. I talk about environmental toxins. I talk about inflammation and, you know, hormonal imbalances. So this is all included in the plan. So it's usually a, a 12 week to three month to a six month plan. And then they stay with me. And then I basically coach them along the journey and get them from where they are to where they want to go. And, um, and I also work with a nonprofit senior organization right now too. So I work with, um, uh, older individuals as well. And I just finished a, a health and wellness, um, challenge for them. And it was amazing because there were so many people who were like, I didn't know this, you know, how could I have not known this? And I'm, you know, at this stage in my life. So it's really, really just so it's so amazing to see people transform and then giving back that empowerment to them that you know what to do now. And, and, and then they, they just, you know, just let them go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like little, thing. little children that you, you, you help rear and raise, and then they're off into the big world. Yeah. Um, yeah. On their own. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, and so where can, I guess people find out more about your programs and where can people reach you for that? Sure. So right now I'm on Instagram and I, uh, I'm working on my website, which was supposed to be done, but, uh, it's taking a little bit longer than I want it to. And I want it to be, um, I just don't want to put it out there until it's uh, super, super ready. So, so right now, and then uh, at my, uh, email address as well, which if, do you mind sharing? At, yeah. It's Sophia G wellness at gmail.com. So it's S O F I A G wellness at gmail.com. And then Instagram is Sophia fit RX, which is S O F I A F I T R X. Yeah. And, so and uh, I mean, you know, uh, like I, I don't mind sharing this. I mean, you um, like you work with my wife and um, you know, you completely transformed not only, you know, looks aside, 
but just the way she approaches food and 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 her entire lifestyle. And so I, I can just speak from, I guess, not personal experience, but being married to someone who's who's been through your program, that it is truly life changing and truly transformative. So you're making a substantial impact on people's lives. So that's that's amazing, Sophia. So um, you. you know, so thank you. And I imagine again, uh, you know, um, my wife is just one of many who could probably speak volumes about what you've done for their lives. So definitely, if you're out there, if you're feeling in a rut, if you feel like you're not being able to meet your uh, your goals, whether they be weight loss, whether they be strength or fitness or just overall wellness. Um, I, I can definitely tell you Sophia's program works and Sophia is there to coach you through each, every, you know, step of the way. So anyway, definitely reach out to Sophia if you're interested in doing that. Um, yeah. So thank you so much, Sophia. Can't thank you enough. Um, any parting words with our audience, uh, as, as, as you wrap up? Oh, I just want to first of all say thank you for having me and thank you for um, for all those words. And yeah, just to the audience that, you know, um, just get to know yourself and and just be self, you know, accept where you are. And then from that point on, you just move to become better. And that's it. Yeah. I think that's as timely as any, you know, ever in terms of uh, it, that advice speaking volumes, not only, especially in this month of Ramadan. So, you know, I always say like, you know, and I'll just leave this maybe with our listeners is like Ramadan, it presents two very, you know, amazing opportunities. One is it's like an annual event. So it's a great barometer um, and, and, a, and a gauge that you can, you know, sort of gauge and measure where you are. Obviously, you can look at that in terms of worldly aspects, like your health and your wellness and well-being, but also obviously your relationship to God and so on. But also Ramadan is a great catalyst. It, 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 you know, it, it increases and there's intensity in what we do, whether it's worship, spiritual things, but also the intensity in terms of what we're able to do within a 24-hour day and what we're focusing on. So um, I would say that that's like a great blessing of Ramadan. So your advice, taking your advice and just sort of building on that, I think it's it's a great time for people to listen to that. So um, we hope, uh, listeners, you have a great rest of your Ramadan. Um, we may come back at you during the month. We'll see. It's kind of right now TBD on scheduling. But uh, if not, you can definitely look out for us on future episodes. Please reach out to us with any comments, feedback, questions. You can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Hit us up on Facebook. Please leave a review if you like what you hear. We always say that. And this is the month of generosity. We are, um, you know, we don't work for a profit endeavor here. Whatever you do helps support the show. So please reach out to us on our Patreon page and make any contrib contribution you can. That's Patreon slash Diffuse Congruence. Uh, Omar, you want to close no, out really with... Yeah, no, I just uh, really enjoyed uh, talking to you, Sophia. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try to take whatever I can uh, from the conversation and, and try to implement it. So I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.